Jörg Tiedemann is Professor of Language Technology at the Department of Digital Humanities at the University of Helsinki, and his main research interests are in cross-lingual NLP and machine translation, and his topic is very timely in the age of large language models. He will tell us about the emergent multilingual semantics in neural translation models, uh, where they pick up linguistic properties and generalize them to meaningful representations when trained on large amounts of multilingual data. And the title, as you can see, Lost in Meaning, Found in Translation. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thanks for being here. A lot of people here, so nice to see you all, also the online people. Um, I hope that I'm not getting lost in my uh, meaning here as well, so I'm, I'm overwhelmed with all the attendance here also with this hall. Um, I hope you can hear me well. There's a bit of an echo, but uh, if you don't understand, please let me know. All right. Um, so, as Krista already said, I, I, I will probably... Uh, present something that you're expecting from me, something about multilingual NLP, and especially looking in translation. Um, but I will walk you through the things that I would like to present. Most of the presentation is related to a research project that we are running, which is called Fortran, uh, which is uh, found in translation, um, where we want to see whether we can use translation models to actually uh, find interesting information that can be learned, emerge from the data itself. Um, just for a brief introduction, uh, just to get you started also, so going back to natural language processing, I typically show this kind of picture where we could uh, divide it into different kinds of parts. So if you look at language technology and what natural language processing tries to solve, we have the part of understanding languages. So we would have some kind of language signals that we would like to read or, or, or listen to, and then a machine can understand what is the meaning or the essential info information behind that uh, signal that we can observe. And then the other part would be the generation part, uh, which becomes more and more relevant. We want to generate uh, also a fluent uh, language so that this could be the full interaction between a machine and the human. Uh, so, so that we have both of these things uh, established through natural language processing so that machines can understand what has been said and, and can also generate uh, language uh, to make a full communication circle. Um, in this picture, I just try to depict a little bit that we have different kinds of representation that are going along the way. Uh, so there might be some more structural linguistic representations that we would like to build uh, or find in, in data. And then we're going up to the level of, of meaning representations, which would be ultimately uh, trying to in, uh, sh show what kind of knowledge is encoded in the language signal. Um, this also has a bit motivation for, for saying why translation is always a nice um, task to work with, because in, in, in translation we have the natural connection between the two. So we have uh, the natural language understanding part and the generation part nicely coupled together, which makes this uh, quite special in a way that uh, we don't have to abstract away. Do, uh, we have those main busy, uh, uh, basic components together in, in one just one setup. Um, what this also means is that uh, we, we basically don't really need uh, specific annotations to, to get some, some kind of information encoded. Uh, so now in the age of, of deep learning, um, I guess the, the picture is quite similar. So, so if you look at natural and language understanding and generation as two components, then uh, neural machine translation tries to model that in, in a similar or um, according way. So we would have some, some way of encoding information, which typically refers to um, understanding the language, the input, and, and trying to map this into some representation, which would be getting closer to some, some meaning representation, hopefully. And then there's the second part, which would be the decoding part, and, and this would be the corresponding to the uh, generation side of, of the things. So nicely coupled together in just one big black box, uh, as, as we now uh, often use it uh, as, as one of the solutions that tries to fit all kinds of problems. So why this is interesting for me, um, and also not only for machine translation, is that th this kind of uh, setup makes it possible that we can, can use the observable things that we can see, namely a source language and a target language, as a signal that we don't really have to annotate ourselves or don't have to um, um, provide to a system, but instead we can collect the information that is naturally being uh, produced by humans. Humans do translations and in that way provide the, um, the implicit supervision that can guide that, uh, that kind of model when training, when learning. 
And the idea is that if you, uh, if you have this setup of encoding and decoding, and there will be some kind of representation in the middle, then the representation level is the latent space that we cannot see, cannot observe at all. Uh, but it can be learned by doing or optimizing the task of, of translating from source to target language. So here the motivation is really that uh, naturally occurring data we can just uh, collect in, in a raw form. We don't have to give explicit uh, expert knowledge about uh, languages to the system, but we, we, we hope that uh, a system that can learn to perform that task would internally also do this kind of mapping that can be interesting to to understand or to see, to analyze and, 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 and see how much of the known linguistic information, for example, is encoded in there. So all this uh, is the motivation part still. So, so in this Fortran project, the, the main uh, interesting question that we try to ask is what happens um, if we make the task a bit harder to the machine or to, to a system that tries to learn information? So if we, for example, have a translation between or a translation system between two languages, it might be quite mechanical. So we might just map things uh, basically uh, on a lexical level. You can do a lot of shortcuts, if, especially if you have uh, very related languages. But the idea would be if we, if we then um, add, add more and more languages, so we make it really multilingual, uh, we would force the system to make stronger abstractions. At least that's the hypothesis. So if we would uh, produce some, some kind of multilingual translation model, that uh, captures all those different languages, then we hope that uh, a system who can perform, that can perform all the different translation directions would also increase the abstractions that are necessary to, to bridge between all those different languages. So the entire motivation for the project uh, was that we want to increase the linguistic diversity. We want to really increase uh, the number of languages to a massive amount so that we have hundreds of languages on the source and the target site and try to train the whole system as a global, um, um, big, big multilingual uh, system. And then the most interesting part for us was to look at the uh, representations that come out of this kind of training procedure. So if you look at that picture, this tries to just, uh, of course, illustrate what we mean. So, so we go more up into more um, abstract uh, representations that get closer to, let's hope, some kind of language agnostic um, uh, meaning representation. Uh, we ask a few questions. So here's the setup of the project um, with the main questions that we were asking. And I will uh, go a bit through those things uh, in, in just after, after this introduction here. So the setup is that, uh, first of all, um, it's, it's of course uh, nice thinking that we could have this kind of global big model that uh, captures all the different languages, can capture all the translation directions, but we still have to ask ourselves, how do we actually build this model in a practical way? So what kind of model is the optimal way? Um, also, remember that this project actually started before uh, the Transformers came out. So, so in, in writing that, uh, uh, that kind of proposal, it was still in the beginning of the neural age. Um, but, but let's say, so we have hundreds of languages and, and we know that uh, from a practical point of view, it's not that easy just to build the model uh, to see that really uh, effectively can learn from all the information. So a lot of... Um, a part of this project is, is basically related to engineering. So we will talk a bit about uh, the kind of engineering part and I will also propose or just uh, give you information about the framework that we are building in, in Helsinki and would like to invite you to also contribute. Um, then once we have um, some, some kind of uh, framework uh, model that we, we know that this effectively can learn from all the information, we come to the essential questions that the, the project we're asking. Um, so, so questions like, what happens to the representations? Uh, what kind of linguistic information do they, for example, encode? Can we see certain structures that are just emerging from the data? So the subproject two here is a lot about interpretation, trying to see what, what are the uh, different kind of phenomena that we can encapture, uh, encapsulate in those representations. So this is rather difficult. As we know, there's lots of parameters and we, can, uh, we have difficulties really to disentangle the, the huge information that is just uh, bound by, by those gigantic models. Um, more convenient is typically that we do some, some kind of downstream um, applications where we can also um, check whether the uh, reasoning uh, capabilities of those systems really correspond to what we expect from improved abstractions. Um, so there's basically two parts here. I should be always careful in saying interlingua. Uh, there's, there's a bit of a kind of a wrong association, I guess, if I say this. What I mean is here some, some kind of more language agnostic representation in the neural way. So, so can we see some kind of abstraction that is really uh, bridging many of the languages that we're having 
at our disposal. So, so can we see that, uh, for example, having those multilingual models, does that push the system into a bit better, uh, into a more uh, uh, clear direction of a lang language agnostic representation? And seeing that in the application that is actually trained for, for translation namely. And then of course, the nice part where we, uh, we are looking now in the deep learning age is that uh, we try to see also whether the representations can do much more than uh, just the uh, objective that they're trained for. Now this is all known to you. So, so we take representations and try to um, apply them to downstream tasks and, and see whether other kinds of reasoning are also possible. And this would be another type of extrinsic or task oriented evaluation. So that, that was kind of the motivational part. And uh, maybe this was not very new to most of you. So, so this is kind of a very standard setup nowadays. Uh, I think when we started five years ago, so it was kind of a new thing still. Uh, but now I would like to get back to a bit more of a Claren type of information that is probably necessary for the infrastructure type of conference that we are having here. Um, I hope that uh, many of you know Opus. Um, Opus is, is the kind of an uh, ecosystem that we are building and, and, and using as the basic infrastructure and environment for all that kind of research. It becomes, of course, very handy for, for this type of questions that we are having. So just very briefly, if, uh, well, you might know Opus, but Opus has been growing a lot over the years. So, so we have been really including and, and trying to be this major hub for, for parallel data. So translation data that you can collect from various different resource, uh, sources uh, and making it uh, in, in a, in a stream, more streamlined way uh, available to all kinds of researchers and developers in the field of natural language processing. So lots of sources come, of course, thanks to the uh, European Union and the translation efforts that they're doing, but more and more the things are also just mined from the web. So, so there's different initiatives that try to get uh, uh, line data from Wikipedia, from, from web crawls uh, like Common Crawl. And, and we are recently also involved in this HPLT project, which is on the top here, uh, that stands for High Performance Language Technologies, where we try to improve uh, the amount of data that we can get from, from, from large web crawls here in, in collaboration with the Internet Archive. So in the end, um, I think we should, we, we really need to acknowledge a lot of the efforts that a few people do, for example, at the Common Crawl Consortium. So, so they, they are providing the actual, um, um, basic fuel that that, that uh, uh, goes into all those models that are now getting so much attention. For Opus, of course, we are focusing on parallel data. So what, what, what we contribute here is that we try to make it very uniform, trying to get all those kind of types of information in the same framework so that this becomes accessible for everyone with nice uh, interfaces. And uh, if you don't know how uh, how to get the data in the easiest uh, um, and most straightforward way, I really recommend to look into the Opus tools, which is just mentioned here below. Um, you can pip install it and, and use it just from the command line to get all the information directly from, from uh, the command line and uh, download the data. So there's, we, we try to have a lot of language coverage. Uh, this is always a bit difficult to count and we, we probably need to uh, improve also a bit the kind of uh, cleanness of, of, of language labeling, but uh, to some counts, we, we would say we have more than 700 languages, a lot of language pairs, we try to really pair up uh, as many as possible. Um, if, if you have parallel data, it's not only English centric, but very much in, in all kinds of language directions. And, and the system, uh, the, the collection is really growing to billions of sentences and, and becoming a size that is really reasonable also in the new age of big data. So, but uh, Opus is not the only thing. So, so we really try to improve the uh, the ecosystem that we are having here. And I just one more picture, just to make it even easier, we compiled the data set, which we call the Tatoeba Translation Challenge, which makes, uh, compiles the whole thing together into a nice setup where you have training data, development data, and test data. So, so for the lazy people who just want to just get everything that you have for a language pair, you can get it from this compilation. You have a nice split into development and test data, and that can get you started for doing research in just that kind of a language direction, if you like. Um, there's a lot of tools also around the, um, the kind of Opus ecosystem. We're working on filtering tools, cleaning tools, and, and, and pipelines for training efficiently uh, machine translation systems. Um, so all of that, of course, internally is also really interesting for us. So we did more or less this, this for loop in trying to get uh, consistently machine translation for all those different language pairs that we have 
included. And we systematically try to train different types of system also in relation to the uh, projects that we are running. Um, and you might know that I'm not really afraid in, in really pushing out a lot of those models and data sets, even if they are a bit noisy. So we try to publish all of that also for transparency reasons uh, so that everyone can use them. And then we, uh, up to now, we have released something like 2,347 uh, translation models that uh, are readily available for you. So you can download them. Everyone can use them. They have a very permissive license. Um, and um, not everyone maybe knows the, the kind of original uh, models that we have pushed, uh, Marianne NMT models. But the most interesting part for, for most people would be the integration into Hugging Face that makes it even easier to really use those systems. But I can tell you not all of those 2000 models are actually there in Hugging Face. So we're lacking a bit behind in all the kind of integration. It's, it's actually hard, hard work to get that done. We also had integration to a European language grid, but there's, there's not a complete uh, um, um, coverage of all those things, different models. Um, especially also with relation to the Fortran project, um, we're also interested in the multilingual parts. So it's not only bilingual systems, but we especially push for multilingual models in various different ways and language groups. So if you're really interested in, we're trying to push all that out. And if you find something interesting that is useful for you, uh, it would also be nice to know some, some kind of uh, use cases and feedback from the community. So all of this is ongoing. I hope we can serve a lot of people with uh, different types of uh, size of models. And, and we're also producing student models that are really efficient and, and nice to work with in, in, in very uh, restricted environments. I have actually no idea how I'm doing with time, but let's see, um, I maybe have to speed up a little bit because I have actually quite a lot still left. Um, okay. Yeah. 20 minutes left. Okay, very good. Um, so, so what I want to get into is a bit more um, interesting things um, um, about the kind of uh, interesting facts that or things that you can learn from multilingual NLP or what you can do with multilinguality. And just to get started again, so I would like to get back again to age, ancient times of, of natural language processing. Uh, so the beginning of time in 2016, um, when we tried to look at uh, multilingual uh, models and, and trying to scale them up, we actually had a nice uh, model that is also for nowadays standards still quite an incre incredible coverage of languages. So Robert Oestling, when he was in Helsinki, he implemented this uh, character level uh, language model. Um, and, and, and ask the question what happens if we, we, if we throw in all the different languages that we have in a huge, massively parallel corpus. Uh, so there's not so many corpora where you have massively amounts, uh, massive amounts of, of translations. The Bible corpus is, is probably the best possibility where you go uh, up to a thousand languages, for example, when you want to scale up in, in, in types of linguistic diversity. So he was basically throwing in all those uh, translations, over 1,300 translations, covering 990 languages, coming up with the idea that we should also um, uh, include a language flag that, in, uh, that informs the system of what kind of language is now encoded. Um, so, so this becomes a bit of a standard, but at that time it was completely new. So the nice thing what is happening here while learning the language model of predicting the next token, also, those language flags become embedded, so they build some kind of uh, language embedding space. And that was the most interesting part to study here. So when we are looking at that, uh, it was actually interesting to see that those language embeddings create a, a space that, uh, that uh, captures certain uh, information knowledge about uh, linguistic properties that we didn't, well, that were not given to the system, but just uh, emerging from, from the training uh, of, of just this kind of character-based prediction. So we looked at the, the embeddings um, and, and tried to see whether they cluster nicely in, for example, more typological clusters of language families. And surprisingly, it was actually nicely uh, uh, related. There's, of course, mistakes, but there's no linguistic information really given to the system besides of the spelling. And from that kind of information, it, it, it nicely learns relationships, like here in this picture, just giving you some uh, Germanic languages clustered together. What is even nicer is that you can use those embeddings <clears throat> as a continuous um, representation of languages. So you can also do some fancy uh, interpolations between them. So, so what Robert did, for example, also he looked at uh, historical variants. Uh, so looking, for example, at the language embedding of Middle English and then trying to interpolate between the vector representation for Middle English and Modern English. 
trying to see what happens if 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 we increase the amount of or the the distance to middle english becomes closer well becomes smaller or we move uh, towards modern english and then we can see what would happen if we then uh, generate uh, just random samples from from the model and you can see it really changes from from the more historical spelling to some modern spelling uh, really showing that the system understands somehow that this really influences what kind of language to generate on the at the bottom on the left side you also see that uh, actually a nice test uh, to to look at cross entropy so if if you look at uh, again this kind of interpolation between middle and uh, modern english uh, and we test uh, we have a test set that comes from the period in between somewhere so the king's uh, king james bible which is in the period uh, between those two different um, uh, extremes we can see that the um, the test set perplexity goes down for for that uh, test set when we have uh, somewhere in the middle of those language embeddings the representation uh, put into the system so it, it seems to even capture a bit of the uh, more um, diachronic uh, variation that we have over time so this is really nice of course you have to take this a bit with a grain of salt uh, so it's not perfect but it's kind of nice and then we had a lot of fun by just uh, making it generate things so I will not uh, spend a lot of time here, but this is the um, the early ages of prompting, let's say. So we try to prompt it with the language flag of saying, okay, generate something in Swedish, and it generates some Swedish Bible text. You can turn on German, uh, giving the German uh, flag, and then it generates German. And then you can do this kind of mixing languages. And uh, I know I mean, I've shown this uh, many times, uh, maybe some of you have seen it, but it's, it's really kind of mixing Swedish and German, uh, making no sense at all, but it, it does have some kind of features uh, just for entertainment. Don't take <laughs> too many pictures of this. This is really not scientific. Um, <clears throat> but but let's say really interesting things you can do. You can mix and, and, and really see what does the system learn about this language space. And that's really entertaining. We should have a demo out there uh, where you can just play around with this. And actually, one of my students now also would like to uh, model something similar, similar and then trying to see whether you can generate um, uh, some 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 uh, average Slavic language that people could use for communicating across different languages. I know that in Scandinavia we talk this kind of Scandinavian, so I'm not really sure if this would work, but at least it would be interesting to see what the system makes out of the information it has. Okay, so other people were math more famous than us, so they invented the same kind of strategy for machine translation basically at the same time. So this is now the standard for multilingual machine translation where we have this language flag and this gives exactly the same kind of prompting for generating the correct output language. All right, so this, this makes it possible then to really learn a gigantic uh, language model, a uh, translation model. Um, and you can basically have a completely shared model that has all the information in there. And what that uh, does is if you have uh, the complete model there, it can lead to transfer learning, uh, transferring across languages, the information that you have for some languages. And this really pushes uh, the performance of some, some under-resourced languages. If you have information not really uh, um, completely available for some smaller languages, you can really get help from, from, especially from related languages, but other languages that can push the performance very well. So here, just a, a picture that uh, some example that I could give. Uh, so the nice thing with Opus and the infrastructure is that we can now systematically study this and really uh, find out what, what are the best ways, optimal ways of doing this kind of uh, multilingual learning. Now, after the blessings, there's the curse. Um, so this was termed also by others, the curse of multilinguality. There's, there's of course problems. So now if you're going to a much larger coverage, we, we have the effect that it doesn't really work in the in the long run, at, at least not easily. So if we now increase the language coverage, then uh, we can easily get to the point where there, there's no actual benefit anymore to throw in more languages. And this is now just an example where you have the same model size keeping constant, uh, adding more languages. You can see that uh, the individual language cover uh, language performance goes down. And that's of course uh, um, a problem. So going back to that paper that we had, so this already was in 2016 that we looked at the model capacity, where you can systematically also see adding more languages and you test uh, test set per, uh, cross entropy, then you can see that the system cannot capture all the information once you come to certain points. So it has a capacity problem um, that, that uh, makes the system perform worse if you have more languages that you need to capture. And it makes sense because you have a lot of information that you want to put in there. 
So this is some kind of limit that we need to address. Uh, then we have the, the skewedness of, of the training data. So of course now it's not so nice that we have all the coverage for all the languages in the same way, but instead we have this really strong Cypian distribution where there's only a handful of languages that have enough data available. So just uh, proxy just taken from Wikipedia showing that we have a very strong bias towards just a few languages. I'm going a bit more quickly here. Um, so, so this also happens not only for language models that we have, um, uh, the problem of growing models um, and, and, and also difficulties to really make them multilingual. Uh, so now for translation models, also the trend goes to ever growing models. So it's also there that the No Language Left Behind pro uh, project uh, produced a model that actually becomes really big, uh, 54 billion parameters for the 200 languages. And it's only 200 languages. So we get to a limit where this is becoming really difficult to, to handle. So, so what I want to say with this, those, those uh, figures here and those kind of images is that maybe we should rethink, and I come now back to the Fortran project where we have to look about modeling, how to improve that kind of thing. So, so what I want to propose, and, and I think also many people are working in the same direction is we should go back to uh, some, some way of modularity to balance the thing between uh, scaling up to many languages, making things bigger and bigger, but also um, trying to see whether we can uh, build components that, that make things a bit more modular and, and efficient. So from the, uh, from the initial picture where we had uh, kind of the translation triangle, we can go back to that uh, just uh, illustration. Again, if you think of that, we go from some kind of understanding to generation and, and we don't want to have it in just one go end to end. Uh, we can think of that having uh, different kinds of modules on different levels would make sense. So if you have source languages that kind of uh, cluster together, should should have this 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 way of encoding certain uh, specific information to that uh, specific language and language groups and language families. So in that way, building up some some way of uh, um, combining different components together. So this is the motivation, and we 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 are really looking forward to test this hypothesis that we can modularize also neural machine translation in this way. So this, this comes now to this uh, mammoth. Um, so, so this is the framework that we're actually building. So I try to just uh, advertise this a uh, bit quickly to you. And, and I'm really hoping that many people are getting there and trying to use it. Am I doing fine with time? OK, good. Um, so advertisement. So, so please, please have a look at this um, URL. Um, so, so we are developing this kind of framework, which is based on open NMT the PyTorch version, but we added a lot of functionality to do that to make that kind of scaling up really possible. So what we want to do is we want to have efficient training that we can distribute over large uh, high performance clusters where we have a lot of nodes working together in parallel, but working on, on a system or on a, an architecture which is highly complex so that we have different types of components uh, very freely put together in ways that we think are interesting. For example, you can have language specific encoders, decoders, you can have some kind of intermediate bridge structures, you can have certain language group components and different kinds of components that really make the system um, uh, highly flexible. So just quickly going through some features, we would like to have different types of parameter sharing. So it comes down to defining what type of information would we like to share between languages and what kind of things would we like to um, have more more language specific or language group specific. So this is the model that we have shown already. So just everything shared is possible also to train with that model, of course. But then uh, the more interesting thing is that we want to have a lot of partial share sharing. So so there's different ways of doing that. For example, you can build those components that that have a very specific encoder component. Uh, you would also have something that is very specific decoder component, but you also have intermediate kind of in a hierarchical way, let's say a component for language groups that put together information coming from different language specific parts. So that uh, in, in lots of different ways, you can build uh, partially shared architectures. There could be also other ways that you, for example, build sub networks inside of an existing network of uh, specialized specialized subnets uh, subnetworks that uh, specialize for certain uh, tasks. And then you would also have the possibility of not sharing at all and just having these kind of components put together in a way that they're trained together, but they're really specific components only. Then we have uh, ways of bridging information. 
so this would mean that we first have language specific components that encode, for example, information about individual languages, and then the information is bridged uh, before it goes to the decoder. So we kind of merge everything together into what we call a bridge, and that information would be then used for, for as a bottleneck information that would be then decoded in different kinds of decoders. So that could be then integrated also in those more complex structures where you have, let's say, language groups, Germanic groups, Romance languages, and try to have a bit of a hierarchical structure where this can put, be put together. And this is also possible to just leave out. So lots of features. And then as this becomes really difficult and, and complex, and you can imagine if you want to train that now in parallel, uh, it becomes an assignment problem of, of making this possible to distribute over a large high performance cluster. So, so we worked very hard in engineering really to make this uh, uh, nicely um, allocated to different GPUs so, so that we don't have uh, nodes that are idling and just waiting for some updates. But instead, uh, um, the distribution of the tasks to different kinds of nodes will be done by a tool called task to GPU. And then we also make it, uh, um, of course, possible that not all the updates or all the components need to be represented in all nodes. But you distribute all the components according to the setup that you have, the architectures, and the updates would only be synchronized on the nodes where those components are present. So this becomes a little bit of a puzzle, and, and we, we hope that our system can manage to make that puzzle uh, work in the best possible way. And then finally, the nice thing is that if you have this component-wise thing, then of course, it will be trained as a gigantic big architecture where you have all those components together. It will be still a, a huge, uh, almost unmanageable uh, architecture to be trained. But then at inference time, you just can take those components and put them together in a way where you have a very efficient way of, of just taking those lightweight components together and make the inference only via those different uh, different parts that that are not that are independent from the others. And uh, now I might have something like two or three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Um, I have two case studies, and maybe I just manage one of them. Uh, but we can we can go back to some others in the question time if you like. Um, so let's look at a case study. So this would be one of the setups where we have uh, independent encoders, decoders, and we try to bridge that, which what we call an intention bridge. And the idea is here that this would be some kind of bottleneck that would uh, every every of the information coming from the encoders would have to pass through that bottleneck here. Um, leaving the task of, of, of uh, parsing or understanding to the indiv individual encoder components and the uh, components of decoding and generating would also language specific. But everything needs to get together with the same kind of um, representation in the middle. We train that with all these different language directions. And then the interesting question is what happens when we train that? So here's kind of a test case where we train that with uh, for the image caption translation task. And the nice uh, thing coming from this picture is that, first of all, we can prove that uh, the, the, the bottlenecking still works. So we can train translation with a performance that is realistic. Uh, so we can translate um, also in the bilingual case, if we just train it, that would be the baseline. The blue bar shows what kind of performance we would get in, in terms of blue. And uh, the most interesting thing is that then if we add more languages, uh, for example, the multilingual case here, the M2M, then the performance for all the individual languages actually goes up. And that seems to um, um, uh, support the uh, information that having more multilingual information available pushes the abstraction that we can get in the intermediate structure in a way that translation really becomes better. So it seems to be a better job in generalizing. Um, and the other interesting thing is that we can do what is called zero-shot translation. So we're leaving out that language pair and the uh, intermediate representation still can bridge between those languages, even though it has never been trained for that. So that is the nice thing about the translation task. And then uh, downstream task, uh, kind of similar picture is that if we test that for bilingual cases or so bilingual languages uh, trained only for those uh, pairs, you can see that we get a certain performance. Now, we all like numbers, so there's a lot of numbers here. Sorry for that. Um, but if you then train that for a multilingual model, then the performance in those downstream tasks goes up, um, maybe slightly in many cases, uh, so maybe not that impressive. 
but we can see that the multilingual information somehow pushes the abstractions into a way where they become more interesting for, for other reasoning tasks. So that was also encouraging. And maybe I skipped the probing task. So this is just showing that, okay, more languages would also encode certain linguistic information in, uh, in a more pres uh, in, in, in a more visible way. So, so if you do probing tasks, uh, probing for certain kinds of linguistic features, then you can say adding more languages seems to push the system in really capturing that kind of information more clearly. But I don't know if I have time for the second. Do I? Quickly, okay. So I just want to showcase that the, this the, the kind of uh, system can be used uh, very flexibly for doing systematic tests, and I like that. So, so now we can test certain assumptions more easily. So, so the second case is that we would like to see uh, if we have different different types of partial sharing at the encoder. What does that really? Um, how does that impact the performance and and the encoding that we are getting? So, so now we're just keeping everything fixed besides of the encoders uh, um, uh, parameter sharing and we, we share just a number of layers and we can go from no sharing at all uh, up to uh, shared everything uh, on the encoder side. Maybe I don't show all the pictures but just giving you the setup. So the question would be um, what, what happens if we have increased the number of languages that we're using for that and we made a, a subselection of languages from Opus. So Opus becomes a handy uh, data set here again. And we have all kinds of things from three to 36 languages that we're uh, sampling from the setup here. So having a very controlled kind of setup, uh, we can then ask ourselves what happens to translation. So this is a bit of a busy picture. Uh, again, maybe difficult to see also why the, because the colors are not perfect, um, but but you have certain certain performance of translation if you have three, six or, 12 or 36 languages. And the main takeaway here is that um, <clears throat> we don't have to share layers to really get better performance, but we can actually manage with uh, more language specific uh, parts components. And even sharing everything can be detrimental in, in the performance. So if you see at the uh, five and six layers shared, you can see that the performance goes down, especially when you have only a few languages in, in, in the setup here. Um, and zero shot is maybe a bit more interesting. So, so if you share more, you would expect that this kind of um, zero shot translation would perform better because they have more of, of, a, of a shared uh, representation in the system. And it really is the case. Uh, sharing more layers uh, leads to more improvement, but only up to a certain point. So, so also there's a point where it actually then goes down and the, and the complete sharing of all the encoder components might not be the best choice here. So we would not have known that if we could not have uh, this kind of systematic way of testing it with this framework that makes it possible to run the very systematic runs that we have here. So in the interest of time, I think I leave those kind of things out as they're also just showing the same kind of picture, mainly showing that we can, we can have language specific components. We don't have to really have complete sharing to have that nice uh, ability of transferring information and, and, and emerging uh, intermediate representations. So what we want to do is, and this is the final part. So what we are doing now is we're building this mammoth flagship model. Uh, so, so what means we take what we have in Opus, uh, we get more info, uh, more data from HBLT, for example, doing at the moment some some extensive hyperparameter open optimization and and trying to figure out what kind of architectures to look at, and then run large scale training um, as as much as we can on on the Lumi platform that we're using as the main resource of uh, computation here. And then we hope that we can answer all kinds of questions about what is the best way of building the multilingual uh, uh, modular model and what can we actually learn from that and how can we also publish uh, all the findings here as, as nice reusable components. So last thing, please join us in this workshop at EACL, which is the Moomin workshop. Uh, and and uh, this is about multilinguality and modularity and, and reuse and efficiency. So if you will see some kind of... Uh, um, call for papers coming out this week. And, and anyone who's interested in that, please join us here and, and make this a really nice, interesting workshop for everyone. And that's that's all. So just summing up, Opus is something that we should know and look at. Uh, it's, it's much more than just the data set. It's a lot of ecosystem around it, a lot of tools and, and different kinds of uh, nice uh, resources. 
And, and please also have a look at Mammoth and, and reach out if you're interested in what I've presented here. So if you want to get involved in this modular um, development, please, please let me know. And uh, here's a bit of sponsors. And uh, thank you all for listening. I'd like to know, um, I mean, uh, now in the large language models, they are already seeing that uh, by cleaning the data more, they, they get a, a better performance out of the system. Have you had similar experiences? Um, um, difficult question as well. So I guess, yes, cleaning is important. Uh, as if you have a lot of noise coming in, then of course the system is distracted by that. Uh, I would say most of the things are a bit of um, let's try and test things. So, so people might not have systematically checked that either. So, so how much cleaning do you really want to do before you get uh, some some kind of optimal performance? It's it's not clear to me. As, as there's also alternative um, work that shows that more data is actually better, even though it's very noisy. So I think this still also happens to quite some extent. Um, what we definitely want to do, and you have seen that in the beginning slides, that we want to curate our data to clean it up, because I also believe that this actually will give us a performance boost. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to find out how much the kind of uh, cleaning of, of parallel data would help us to improve performance. Um, what I also believe is that maybe the way of training needs to be optimized so that you might want to train in some scheduled way so that you would have some clean data first and then going to more noisy data to have coverage uh, of, of other things that you might want to cover or the other way around. So I don't, I don't know. Um. Um, I see a lot of uh, training, fine tuning, a lot of testing. Would there be a role for clearing to help you do your job better, greener, faster? Well, in general, of course, uh, more data is always good for us. So if there's more data that we can get also via Clarion would be really interesting for us as scaling up to many languages is problematic. So um, we do have enough data for English nowadays, but but we probably would like to have something for more smaller languages that can push the performance for those kind of languages. That's one thing. Another really important thing is that evaluation of what is coming out here. So that someone is really looking to the performance and saying that, certain kind of tasks are really performed better by a model that has a certain structure, a certain kind of setup. So helping with the evaluation, I think, would be um, very valuable for us. Um, yeah. And data curation in general, I guess. So I'm also very ignorant to all kinds of languages that are in Opus because I don't know those languages and I know there's a lot of garbage in there. So cleaning that up would be <laughs> a very useful thing. Yeah. Jörg, thank you very much for this inspiring talk. And, um, and when you were talking about adding uh, additional layers or groupings of, of uh, languages which are genetically close, did you experiment with languages which were not genetically closed as well? Okay. I'm, I'm, we have experience on that because we were applying this approach to another task on task on dependency parsing. And then we came up sometimes with quite surprising results that genetically close languages added or subtracted from the model uh, actually didn't uh, prove the parsing, but for instance, typologically similar, but genetically completely unrelated languages approve, have added to uh, performance of the model. Yes, uh, so definitely we also want to look at that. Um, so, so this is a bit of the architecture search, let's say. So we want to have different ways of grouping languages together, depending on, let's say, typological information that we have from linguistic experts. Um, but then we also would like to compare that with, let's say, a random random grouping or some some more data driven groupings uh, of of languages. So, so we at the moment we are trying to set that up in a way that we can more systematically do this uh, data driven grouping, for example based on some clustering, uh, just maybe random based uh, groupings, and then compare that to a more linguistically informed one and then see what we can conclude from that. 
I also do think that, for example, if you have Finnish, Swedish, we have a lot of things in common because of social contacts that probably uh, there's a lot of um, 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 tran transfer of knowledge going on between those languages, but uh, linguistically they are far away. So, so that would be one example. But yeah, no, I'm definitely interested in that as well.